as our Korean tea scum calls us, from our time of community into the quiet presence of God. Let us prepare for worship as our candles will be lighted this morning by our confirmands, Anthony and <laughs> Grace to you and peace as we come to worship on this holy day and welcome to all, especially to any who might be worshiping with us for the first time. This is the fourth Sunday in Lent and together we are making the journey toward the cross and beyond to new life. Let us come now to consider who we are and whose we are as the shadow of the cross grows imminently longer. And may we come remembering that the cross reminds us that there's no such thing as casual Christianity or comfortable commitment. And so it is in this holy place made sacred by our presence. We worship our God who guides us on the journey and we offer our voices in song as followers of Jesus Christ. Let all who are able please rise as we sing when I survey the wonders of us. This is the season of Lent, a season to be in covenant, remembering the life and death of Jesus Christ. A season to consider the brokenness and bitterness in our lives and be open to forgiveness and reconciling love. A season to ask ourselves how we, like Peter, are afraid and turn away from life. A season to ask ourselves how we, like you, dare to risk passion for all the brothers and sisters, we are calling, we know the pain of salvation. This is the season to journey within that we might reach out more fully as God's people in the faithful covenant. Amen. And let us offer our prayer of confession together. 
Holy God of all seasons and centuries, we give thanks for your presence on the journey. We confess that we are sometimes without courage to confront the brokenness in ourselves and the sufferings of others. We are sometimes lacking in strength to make the sacrifices necessary for community commitments in the way of Jesus Christ. Too often we allow burdens to bend us over and weigh us down. Too often we are rigid and unyielding in our need to control. Free us and forgive us, O God, and create within us a right spirit of love and just compassion that we will be filled with your power to be healers and bearers of your love in the name of Jesus. Amen. Christ has come among us, teaching, restoring, healing, and renewing. The miracle of Christ's presence is offered as a gift of hope to us this day. We receive the gift that God loves us enough to heal all our wounded, broken, stressed out faces. Thanks be to God who creates in us a clean heart. Amen. The following baptized persons have indicated their desire to join this, our community of faith. They are here to profess their faith and join us in serving Jesus Christ. So I would invite them to come forward, Michaela Andre and Chemisi Ofegu. I invite you to hear these words spoken by Jesus to the followers. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should bear fruit with your lives, and that your fruit should abide. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Anyone who abides in me, and I in them, will bear much fruit. Friends, Christ has chosen you, called you together with us, into the church, the body of Christ. And now you are called in this time and place to unite with us in the ministries and the blessing of this particular family of God. And as you come in our midst, I would ask these questions of faith. Do you profess Jesus Christ as the Holy One sent from God to show us how to live? And if so, please say, I do. And do you promise by the grace of God to follow in the way of Christ, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and the word of God as best as you are able, if so, please say, I do. Do you promise to participate in the life and mission of this church family, sharing regularly in the worship of God and in the work of this congregation as it serves our community and world? If so, please say, I do so promise. I do so promise. In the name of Jesus Christ, on behalf of the Seacom Congregational Church, we welcome you in, this, in Christian love as members of this church family. We promise you our friendship and prayers as we share the hopes and labors of the Church of Jesus Christ. Together we may continue to grow in the knowledge and love of God and be witnesses to the risen Christ in our world. Let us pray. Most Holy God, we praise you for calling us all to faith and for gathering us into the Church, the Body of Christ. 
We thank you for sending to us these very special people created in your image. And we pray that together we may live in your spirit, build up one another in love, share in the life and the worship of this church, and work together to serve the needs of others, witnessing to your love for all people everywhere. Amen. Now as our newest members sign the book and receive their certificates of membership, may we all remain seated and say, Blessed be the tie that binds. In sharing our gospel reading today, Ruby Larry and Ellen Hindle. Hear now these words from the Gospel of Luke, the story of the lost son and the elder brother. Jesus told this story. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pies that the pigs were eating, but no one, no one gave, him, gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your highest servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quip! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate with a party. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and he, was and he is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered to his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when, when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. May God bless these words to our hearing. Will you pray with me? Most holy God, help us to see the treasures and to know that we too are loved. 
Amen. This is a storytelling sermon. And here is the first story, a few decades old, but relevant for today. It's about a certain woman. Her name is Bilikis Adabiyu Abiola. And she was given a wonderful opportunity. One day when the time felt right, she packed her things, said goodbye to all her friends and family, traveled thousands of miles from her home in Lagos, Nigeria, to New England, where she would study hard and work diligently toward a Master's of Business Administration degree from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. That MBA from MIT would open up a world of possibilities for Billy Keys. She could start a new business or work for an established company at a high salary. Soon she'd have enough money to provide for her family at home and buy just about anything she wanted. Yet this is not who this young woman is or was. One day while she was still far from home, Ilakis figured out what she really wanted and what her purpose was in life. She had seen people in the United States sort their trash into recycling bins and learned how this simple act of recycling helps preserve the environment by dramatically decreasing the amount of trash in landfills. And of course, the urgent need for everyone to care for the earth and the planet. Then this young woman thought about her home in Nigeria where trash is really a gigantic problem. And she thought to herself, people in the United States are very careful about taking care of waste. Why not Nigeria, she said. In Lagos, about 60% of the trash made by the 21 million residents is never collected. It sits in piles and sometimes in the streets. More than a horrible nuisance, uncollected trash is a dangerous health hazard as well. And garbage piles are breeding grounds for flies and rodents that spread disease. So Billy Keith's new way of seeing trash awakened her to new possibilities for that MBA she was earning. She wasn't going to use her degree to start just any business. No, she decided that after graduation, she would return home to start a recycling business to help Nigeria with its trash problem. She began to formulate a plan she could put into action when she arrived in Lagos. She considered startup costs and many of the business logistics, and she thought about ways to educate people about the benefits of recycling and how her company would help, and she would call her company We Cyclers. Soon after graduation, she began the long journey home eager to make a difference for her people. Upon arrival, things didn't go as planned. When she shared her messages of how recycling would help the environment, many of the people in Lagos were not listening. As we often know, it can always be difficult to get people to change their ways, maybe especially with something as apparently trivial as trash. But then she had another inspiration. Rather than showing people what recycling could do for the city, she would show them what recycling could do for them. She would show people the value of what they were throwing away. Lagos generates approximately 735,000 tons of plastic each year, worth about 300 million to waste brokers, who resell it to recyclers and others. It's money lying in the street, Billy Keith says. Not only would recycling help the city with their trash problem and cut down on the spread of disease, it would be great for the environment. It would generate cash and money that could help people improve their lives in many, many other ways. So, Billy Keith started offering incentives, in essence, paying people for their recyclables. Today, We Cyclers is cleaning up. They visit some 6,000 homes each week, exchanging cash and household goods for recyclables, collecting 40 tons every single month. This young woman who traveled far from home to Boston and then back is changing the way the people of Lagos look at their garbage. The lost money once left lying in the street is now being reclaimed. What was once trash is now seen as a treasure. Story two, the prodigal son. As Larry and Ellen read this story from Luke 15, Jesus tells that similar story about a young person who moves far away from home. Unfortunately, that move far away from home has quite a different narrative than the story of Billy Keese. Because one day that young man receives a startling opportunity. He boldly, insultingly, had asked his father right up front 
for his share of the future inheritance. Never done back in those days. When the dad just complies, dividing his assets, giving out what would one day belong to his younger son, the boy leaves. Like Billy Keese, this young man travels far from home, but he doesn't attend the finest schools, find a good job, or in any other way use this opportunity to improve himself. Instead, he squanders that money, as the gospel said, in extravagant living. That's how Jesus delicately put it. After some time in his new home, he too finds himself looking at trash, namely his life. Where Billy Keyes saw an opportunity, this boy saw how his life had hit rock bottom. Jesus said it was then that this young man came to himself. He had turned his dad's treasures into trash, and it was time to turn his life around. He devised a plan for going home. He rehearsed an apology. In humility, he would ask his dad for a job. Thankfully, this is not the end of the young man's story because, like Billy Keyes, the father sees value where others don't. When the boy is still far from home, his dad spies him off in the distance and setting aside his status as a patriarch and landowner, the father, to the surprise of anyone watching, hikes up his robes, sprints out to greet the son. And when the young man begins the speech he had planned for this moment, the dad is not listening. Dad doesn't want to hear about the son's mistakes. He doesn't need the young man to debase himself. Instead, the father is overjoyed. The true treasure he had lost when his son left home has now been returned to him. Calling for robes, rings, and fatted calves, the father demonstrates that he sees in his son treasure, not trash. And that powerful example of love is transformative. That the son chooses to change. And perhaps many of us can put ourselves in that young man's place. Perhaps we too may have at one time or another had a voice inside of us that only wants to dwell on the garbage in our lives. Maybe we've made mistakes. Perhaps like a discarded bottle or can, we might have felt that whatever was of value inside of us had been poured out. Thankfully, God is the great redeemer, or perhaps the great recycler, who sees something very different. Each one of us has been made in God's image, and God is not about to cast us aside, relegating us to any landfill. As Billy Key saw the abandoned aluminum and plastics as money lying on the street, so God sees the value in each one of us. Even when we might feel as though we're far away from the Holy Presence, the great good news is that we've not ever been abandoned. We've not been tossed aside, and in this time of Lent, as we move toward the cross and beyond, our faith calls us, each of us, to know our worth, to know that God loves us, sprints toward us, embraces us, welcomes us home, and in that loving, perhaps then calls us to recycle. Jesus tells this story not only so those who feel untreasured can know their value in the eyes of God, but also Jesus tells the story to call those who have been recycled to become recyclers themselves. So we ask, are there people in our lives who reinforce the old message? Remember, initially Billy Keese had trouble convincing the people of Lagos the value of recycling. She saw the money lying in the streets that would offer that new life, but they didn't. Neither does the older brother in Jesus' story. While his dad is celebrating the gift of his restored family, that older brother still sees trash. In his complaint filed with his father, he names his younger brother's sins as bluntly as he can, trying to convince his dad that the younger brother is still a worthless pile of landfill trash. But the dad isn't listening. He points to the value of both of his sons, the one who has been found and the one who was never lost. Both are treasures. Then he invites his son to the party. And while the bulk of Jesus' story focuses on the younger son, the point might have more to do with the older one. The original audience for this parable isn't a nameless group of people gathered on the hillside. Luke tells us exactly to whom these words were, at, were addressed. They were addressed to the Pharisees and the legal experts, the older brothers, all of them who are grumbling about Jesus, grumbling that Jesus welcomes tax collectors and sinners, younger brothers. 
The Pharisees and the legal experts had reputations for giving up on certain segments of their society. People were labeled as sinners, tax collectors, Samaritans, adulterers, lepers. They were the unclean, welcome and unwelcome in worship, unwelcome among those who saw their position with God as so-called secure. The labeling was a convenient way of dismissing others and absolving themselves from any responsibility for caring for them. We shudder to think how people could do such a thing, but we still have to ask, don't we still see that today? Ostracizing, alienating, labeling, insulting. There are those who stand at the side of the road with placards, pointing out the culture of poverty or hunger or homelessness or mental illness. Others see the virtual roadsides of Facebook and other social media sites, blaming outsiders, sinners, ethnic groups for problems in our country or our world. We too label people. Just think of how often that happens and thereby dismiss them, often subject to social ostracism. Or maybe we're silent, don't speak out as Jesus would have us do. I once lived at the edge of Appalachia and heard people use expressions like trailer trash, referring to human beings. I thought back and I realized I didn't really speak out when I heard as Jesus would have done and wanted me to do. We cast out, we discard. We forget that we are created in God's image. When we read the Gospels, we find Jesus where he meets those who have been tossed aside. They come first with Jesus. Several years ago, I saw Jesus in the midst of a trash heap in Haiti, over 30 years ago, in the infamous city de Soleil. This Jesus took the form of a priest from the Netherlands who walked with us through this unbelievable place of habitation. Mountains of trash and excrement, no plumbing, shelters of tin and sticks and pieces of whatever could be found. People surviving, barely scraping out a living from the trash, risking their lives and their health to survive. This is where Jesus would be, and this is how Jesus calls us to care, to reach out, to not be silent in the face of rhetoric that excludes or demeans, ridicules or treats human beings as trash to get rid of. In the biblical stories, we learn Jesus heals. Heals the lepers, forgives the tax collectors, eats with sinners, welcomes a woman with a questionable reputation who came to the well in the middle of the day. All those stories. And we can say that Jesus is the great recycler, reclaiming, redeeming the treasure that we often miss. And as people of faith, Jesus invites us to join him in this work. God's way as shown to us in Jesus, is a tremendous recycling program, welcoming the lost back home, inviting us all to the party. The older brother missed the party. He refused to see the treasure in his younger brother, choosing instead to focus on the trash. Friends, God calls us through Christ to find the treasure, to spend our lives on that which is worthy to spend our lives on. What Jesus does give us is a purpose high and holy, to which we can devote ourselves, that which will always and forever bring us back home to God. This season of Lent reminds us that the story of Jesus inevitably moves toward the cross. And Jesus was willing to risk the embarrassment of being stripped and beaten and hanged to die, to be held up for the whole world to see on that Friday. And it is through this cross that God chooses to reveal the power of love, the greatest treasure, in the trust and the hope that it will be recycled through each one of us. And so it is on this, our holy day, will we be coming to the party? We've been invited by name. And remember, as people of faith, Jesus continually invites us to join in the great work of reclaiming and redeeming the greatest treasure through the love that we share. And we also remember that we, as followers of Christ, are called to invite others to this, our faith community. Those who are seeking maybe something more. Those who might be searching for the treasure of faith. Because there is this great treasure here. And most of all, the treasure of knowing that we are loved. And that love, through Christ, is ours. May it be so for all of us. Thanks be to God.
Amen. And I invite us to rise as we sing, Love Divine, all love excelling. Please check out all of my emails for our list of prayer concern names, our YouTube video link, and items needed for the food pantry, and all of our upcoming events. And for those people watching on uh, from home today, you'll notice that we've moved the cameras. The camera used to be on this side of the sanctuary, it's over there. So let us know if you like the, the different chains that we've done. And there is a sign-up sheet in the hall for the Lenten seminars on March 31st, and the dates and times of Easter week services are listed in the back of our bulletin. And if you would like to bring a flower in for um, Easter for the altar, please complete the green form that you were given on your way in, and you can leave it in the collection plate on your way out. And the stewardship kindness theme will continue through May 22nd when we will celebrate with our children. Uh, T-shirts have been designed and we are hoping that everyone will purchase one and wear it on that day. We are selling them at cost, $6 for children, $8 for adults. There's many colors to choose from. You can order your, your shirt through Easter over in the hall today. Um, and also there are many other things to do over in the hall. So we ask that all of you go to Coffee Hour. Um, if you remember a few years ago, we used to have a labyrinth painted on the floor in the hall. Well, that had been removed, but um, Kristen was able to uh, borrow a cloth labyrinth that is now set up over there. So we are asking uh, you to go over and feel free to walk through the labyrinth today. And also in Coffee Hour, there is a wall banner made by the confirmation class when they were at an overnight retreat uh, this past week, this weekend, um, in Craigville. So please take time to chat with the confirmands as they will all be over in the hall. And if anyone here is joining us today for the first time, we welcome you. And on the way out, we have put the guest book back up in the corner. So please feel free to sign the guest book. Please enjoy your week, be safe. Please continue to reach out to others and I hope that you are all in good health and spirits. And now please welcome Larry and Ellen Hindle with our stewardship message. And after that, you can enjoy Judy Provo singing How Great the Love. Thank you. to share a little bit about what I love about the church. The church for me is a place I can call home, a place I can be at and feel comfortable with who I am, knowing that I'm not being judged. The church is like my home away from home, and the people in it are like my second family. The church has seen three generations of my family, and I am the latest one. 
Growing up in the church, I've experienced numerous things, but the biggest influence for me was the youth group event. They led me to meet an amazing group of people that you can see all the way in the back over there. <laughs> These people are the people I know I can trust and rely on. They have shaped me into the person I am now and created many lifelong memories for me. Confirmation has allowed me to see the knowledge that the people in the church possess. Confirmation has allowed me to dig deep into myself and ask questions I never would have thought to. All these years in the church have made me see things I never saw, hear things I never heard, and think things I never thought. The church is a place I'm always excited to go to, knowing I'll get to learn something new every time I go. The church has shaped me and molded me into the person I am now. I would never trade anything for the church, knowing it has changed my life forever. Yeah. It's a hard act to follow. Um, mine's a little bit different. I think Larry's going to speak on for both of us in terms of what this church means to us. Um, I'm going to talk about something a little different. Two years, March 2020 to March 2022. I remember once reading that for some, Lent is much longer than 40 days. We might agree that a strong comparison could be made between the heaviness we associate with this time in our church calendar and the past two years. And while Lent has always been the most meaningful season to me because it forces me to pause, dig deep and reflect, challenging me in uncomfortable ways, it has also taught me the importance of kindness and being kind. More than ever, the last 24 months have taught me the need for extending simple acts of kindness because in the end, they were the things I had control over doing. It hasn't always been easy. There are enough factors out there that would like us to believe the worst, but I found that if I could curate my own arsenal of kind news, that might help me pursue a better purpose. So here are a few recommendations I would like to share with you that come from the popular culture and most, de I should call them class, and most definitely promote kindness. Some of you may be familiar with, um, some, of, some you may be familiar with already, others might be new, but here they are. Ted Lasso. If you haven't seen this Apple TV show, please consider doing so. It's body and funny and everything Every time we finished an episode, both Larry and I wanted to be like Ted. <laughs> On PBS, All Creatures Great and Small, you may be familiar with the James Harriet story, but they've been updated in 2021 and the show is pure joy. People with integrity doing the right thing, humbly and with kindness. Other shows like Dairy Girls and Schitt's Creek are filled with what my daughter Amy calls earnest humor. Everyday people exposing their vulnerabilities with love and laughter. I'm an Instagram believer, follower, but largely because my feed is filled with posts that make me smile. Sites like the Good News Movement and Upworthy celebrate the very best in humanity. I follow a poet named probably Tom Foolery, whose lyrical couplets remind us that we are here for each other and we elevate the world when we look out for one another. Then there's Chef Jose Andres, whose work with the World Central Kitchen is enough to make every person want to jump in and help feed the hungry. Every Sunday night, Maria Shriver posts an encouraging, encouraging reminder that often references our worries about the world and with a reminder that we are all here together and will use our energy for a better week. Jennifer Garner's work with Save the Children and Once Upon a Farm inspire, uh, cheerfully inspire a whole new generation. I can only speak for myself, but I know that I am a much happier and hopefully nicer person when I can laugh and see the bright side. The escapism and, and encouragement these things have provided have been worth the apps that my kids pay for, quite frankly. Let us watch them. <laughs> I have several topics I'm going to talk about this morning, but it shouldn't take more than about a half hour. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to talk about stewardship, my family, and what this church means to all of us. Then we'll, then we'll probably move on to a few other things, if Joy allows me to. 
<laughs> As many of you know, and I've mentioned all of this before, standing up here, Ellen and I, Ellen and I arrived in Seacon 32 years ago. And one of the first things we did was join this church. We left the Pocatuck, Connecticut Congregational Church and were lucky to land here, where we soon found ourselves immersed in teaching Sunday school, where we stayed until our youngest into confirmation. Along the way, we helped out at the church dinners, worked on various boards and committees, prepared and served at soup kitchens, went on trips with the confirmators, and a mission trip to Haiti. At the time, we just wanted to get involved and help out. What we didn't realize was that throughout all of this, we were connecting and building relationships with our fellow church mem members and others. Back when our children were much younger, we were doing this out outside summer soup kitchen, I think it was Dexter Street in Central Falls. We really got to know Alan, Eleanor Drapo, who more than once teamed up with our family to serve those in need. We never would have known how very special Alan and Eleanor were had, not, had we not gotten involved. This is true with everyone we have had the pleasure and good fortune to work with. We have created a sort of bond with so many people. When I look across the aisle here in the sanctuary on Sunday mornings and I see Greg and Meg Salguero, I remember working together at that small schoolhouse on the hill in Haiti, building pretty, but pretty simple but functional desks. Of course, Greg sees me staring at him. <laughs> He'll probably He's probably thinking, what the heck's wrong with Larry? <laughs> and I'm just reflecting, of course. And the same goes with seeing what, someone like Ron Rupert, who I didn't know prior to going to, with the confirmations to New Orleans, and, it, and other crew members that went to New Orleans after Katrina. It happens all the time to all of you, I'm sure. In fact, it's happening right now with the confirmation class. They probably don't know it. But years from now, they'll pass each other as seniors in high school or later in life and smile to each other or just nod, knowing that they once served together to help others. I told you I had a lot to cover. <laughs> so why am I telling you all this? I'm not really sure. I've lost track already of where I was going with this. With random acts of kindness and helping others, we are building relationships and a sense of community, and that's what it's all about. For Ellen and I, it started with the value of values instilled in us by our parents. When we moved to Seacock, we were just barely in our 30s, seems like just a few years ago. It didn't take long for this church to become the foundation of our family. The importance of this church has made its way to our children, so much so that our oldest, Amy, was married to Eric by Joy in this church last August. And our middle child, Paul, recently contacted Joy and asked if she would marry he and Madison this September, right here in this special space. So again, I ask myself, where am I, why am I telling you all this? Well, I'm on the stewardship committee, and I know that you all received a letter from, this, from the committee, and along with that, that's not it, here it is. It's a little blue pledge card. That's it, the P word, pledge card, I said it. <laughs> there it is. Now we're gonna get down to brass tacks. Enough with the kindness stuff. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm very sincere about this. <laughs> uh, I would just like you to think about how much this church means to all of you when you're considering this year's pledge. I'll never forget Jan Marie's response many years ago when she asked me to become a deacon. And being in the thick of it, what with time commitments, three children, raising raising a family, work, everything going on at that time, I asked I asked what kind of commitment, what time of time, what time, kind of time commitment would be involved? Well, she looked at me and simply said, Larry, you do what you can when you can. So I'll say the same to you right now about pledging. You do what you can when you can. Of course, if you can see to giving the church a little bit of a raise this year, that'll be all right. <laughs> One last funny story. Of course, our church is always brainstorming about ways to raise money to pay the bills. I had this idea I ran by the stewardship committee a few weeks back during one of our Zoom meetings. I'm telling them how many people have credit cards, myself, all of you. And once a year, at least with me, once a year, I get this check in the mail, it's called cash back. So we get a certain percentage based on what we spend. And I'm thinking, geez, what if we gave our cash back checks to the church? Well, I'm saying this to the, in front of to the computer screen on the Zoom meeting, and all of a sudden I hear a couple of pants drop, footsteps from running to the dining room, it's Ellen, 
She looks at me and says, are you out of your mind? <laughs> no one, you can't say that to the congregation. No one's, no one's going to do that. And I, it was. It was a little tongue in cheek, but not a half bad idea, really, to think about it. It's money we're not really planning on. When the hell are we are planning on it? <laughs> Just something to think about. Actually, what I was thinking was, you know, with SCC, UCC, we could become the SCC, UCC, CBC, Cashback Church. It's got a great drink to it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to wrap it up. <laughs> Many years ago, Ella was promoting Random Acts of Kindness at the middle school here in Seacock, where she teaches. She had acquired these books and some pins that were distributed throughout the school. Here's one of those pins right here. When we chose the kindness theme for this year's campaign, the stewardship committee decided to have pins made for everyone. So you can get yours after the service on your way out to see Donna. Practice random acts of kindness with them proudly. We were unable to locate any more of these books that Ellen had for the school that year. However, she did find about eight or nine brand new copies so we wrapped them up in brown paper, and Ellen placed them in the pews the other night. You might have one, you might not. So at the end of the service, you can open it up, take it home, read it, and then pass it on to a friend or another fellow church, church member. I know I've taken up more time than I was allotted. <laughs> so I guess we won't be changing the words to, this is the day in singing. <laughs> I won't do it, I promise. Next year. However, I would like to read a prayer and find it. <laughs> there it is. I should have it memorized. I want to read a prayer that a small group from this church says on Saturday mornings at doorways after we've loaded our cars the bags of groceries to be delivered to shutters. Jim, Benny and Barney, Lori, Cindy's join us and Tom. We're kind of, it's never one of these little bond things you make, right? It's another example of a small sort of bond that is formed between us, which is very special. Ellen suggested we use this prayer when the pandemic, st oh, when the pandemic started a couple of years ago when we meet at doorways. Lord, help me to realize that every time I wipe a dish, pick up, pick up an object off the floor, assist a child in some small task, or give another preference in traffic or in the store. Each time I feed the hungry, clothe the naked, teach the ignorant, or lend my hand in any way, it matters not to whom. My name is Simon, and the kindness I extend to them, I really give to you. Thanks for putting up with me. Well, Larry used all my time, so I can't say <laughs> <laughs> How great the love that held in Oh, <laughs> 
for your presence that surrounds us this day with humor and hope, with gifts of love, with the treasure of being your people. We pray this day, O oh God, for all of those who are caregivers and for those in need of care. We pray for all of those in rehab and assisted living and nursing homes. We pray for all who are struggling or hurting in any way. We pray for the Putney family in the loss of Bob and for all in the Major Irons family. We pray for the family of Fran Kulak as her memorial will be celebrated this Saturday. We pray, O oh God, for all those on the prayer concern list especially Olga and Ronnie, Nate, Audrey, Alice, Joe, Karen, Ben, Fred, Dennis, Millie, Grace, Paula and Marilyn, Hazel, Scott, Janice, Judith, Susan, Roger, John, Bill, Mary Lou, Elspeth, Alexis, Elliot, Lindsay, Tim, Anthony, Mercedes, and so many more, O oh God. Be with each one and with their families. We pray for those recovering from illness or surgery, all those battling addictions or mental illness or depression, all those suffering from fears or loneliness or anxiety. And we pray, O oh God, for our country and the changes that are crucial for peace and justice in our land. And we pray for all of those who are celebrating passages on their life journeys. Always we pray for our Haiti partners, O oh God. And today, most especially for the people of Ukraine and all the refugees finding shelter and safety, all who have lost loved ones. Hear our prayers, O oh God, all that rise up from the deepest places of our own hearts and continue to guide us, that we might serve you in loving ways and tell the story of Christ's love with our faithfulness and compassion. Most holy God, we offer all of our prayers to the one whom you sent to show us the meaning of love and new life, Jesus the Christ. And in that holy name, we offer the prayer taught to all of the followers as we say together, Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, we come now bringing all that we are and all that we hope to be as followers of Jesus Christ. And as we come to the table, we remember how on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and giving thanks, blessed it and broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this always, remembering me. In the same manner also, Jesus took the cup and giving thanks, blessed it, and said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant, which is the covenant of love. Do this also, remembering me. Ministry, now in Christ's name, I invite all who live and love in that holy name to share the bread and cup. And while partaking, please sing our hymn as we take our communion together. us at this your table and we pray that you will continue to guide us to live in every way through Christ's love with the hope and the treasure that is ours through this Lenten season. Amen. Let us join in singing our hymn of faith. share together our words of parting. O oh God, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is a given that we receive, it is a pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is a sign that we are born into eternal life. Amen.
the peace of Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us as we go forth to love and to serve. Amen. Amen. Amen.